All right, hi guys, I'm Christopher Rizzo, uh, as you already know, but uh, I'll be presenting today on basically using advanced query techniques using the Normalize and Ramda JS libraries. Now these are uh, very powerful libraries and they can improve the uh, strengths of our functions and queries, uh, but to use them most effectively, however, requires that we do a little bit more upfront thinking and planning when we start building out our apps. So basically, if you think more, you can code less. So uh, by thinking deeper at the start of our project, it's easier for us to code later on. Uh, so what should we think about? Well, uh, the two things I'd like us to start thinking about would be normalizing data and currying functions. So when we think about our data, we need to think about how our data is structured so that we can normalize it later and allow for easier access and manipulation. Uh, as far as currying goes, we need to think about the types of functions that we're going to be reusing throughout our application so we can generate a function that generates those functions and makes you code less. So what is data normalization? Basically, it's a process uh, to reorganize JSON data uh, by making the deeply nested objects a bit more accessible. So we do this with Normalizer by importing the Normalize library, uh, the Normalizer library and the Normalize function and calling that function on some of our data with a schema, which is basically a blueprint we create ourselves that tells Normalizer where the nested objects are. So what does that look like? Uh, for a single instance, we have on the left, that's your normal data. Uh, notice that in our main data, uh, our main data is basically an album object, which has a nested artist object, as well as a nested product object. And in that nested product, we have categories, which is an array of nested category objects. Now on the right, this data has been normalized. And while it looks like it's a bit more for this single instance, you can actually look at it and see that the category objects have been pulled out of that product object, which means if we needed to access those, we can just go to entities.category instead of going three levels deep into our object. So what does it look like with multiple instances? Uh, over here, we basically have normalized data for four album objects. If this was raw data, I wouldn't even come close to fit in this mess on my slideshow. Uh, basically, normalize makes it much easier for me to access that nested data. And you can see here, it pulls those categories out from each individual project and just lists them once under category. And now within those products, categories has been replaced with an array that points to those category objects. Uh, so if I wanted to access those categories in each product, I would have to visit each category array of every single product and compare it to a category holder variable to know if I've already done something with that type of category. Here I can just access them directly. Uh, basically, this gets harder and harder the bigger and more complex of a database you have. So normalizing becomes very essential when you're working at scale. So normalizer cares about entities or, or to you and I, nested objects. So when talking with Normalizer, we can ignore the plain object properties and instead define the nested object structure for Normalizer, which would look something like this on the right side. Basically, we would go to Normalizer and say, hi, Normalizer, this data is a single album object, which has a single nested product object, which also holds a nested array of categories as well as an artist object. So that's basically what we do when we define schema coming up on this slide here. Uh, however, I won't bore you with the details here as it's pretty straightforward in their documentation. So normalized data is easier to interact with. And I've got a little example here where basically this is a query that has pulled out raw data. If I wanted to access those categories, I would have to do a double nested for each loop and then run it through a Ramda function to filter out if I've already dealt with those categories or not. This query here works with normalized data and it's straightforward. I just go index, uh, I use a Ramda function to access that entities.categories object and I just have all of them right there. So that brings us to part two, which is writing more powerful database interactions. And our friend Curring. So Curring allows you to construct a specific function over time by passing in the arguments at various stages. The nested inner function will have closure over those arguments that have already been called. So when I call that curried function with only some of the arguments, I receive a new function that awaits the rest of the arguments I haven't passed in. Once that function receives its final argument, it will output the result of its nested function using all the closed over arguments. So in my example here, I've uh, manually created a curried function that takes an item name, a store, and a quantity. 
uh, when I pass in just eggs, I get back a function that will always have closure over eggs. So then I pass in the store name Whole Foods, and then I pass in 12, and I get back, I remember that I need to get 12 eggs from Whole Foods. Um, I could just pass in eggs to start and get eggs, and now I can pass in a different store later on if I change my mind down the road and want to go somewhere else to get the eggs. But I don't have to tell it that I need to still get those eggs again. So in Ramda, all of its, the library's built-in functions are curried, but Ramda provides us with r.curry, which will create a curried function with special functionality out of a function that I give it. Uh, one of those special features of the Ramda curry is this Ramda underscore, which is basically a placeholder value to specify a gap when I have a curried function. Basically what this means is you see here in the second example, get items from Whole Foods. I don't have to tell it the item I want or the quantity. I could just give it Whole Foods and now later on I can go to that function whenever I want to get things from Whole Foods, even though that that was the last argument in my function. So what? Uh, basically, as developers, we frequently write code that follows similar patterns. Uh, take model queries, for instance. With Currian, we can model those patterns in a function and then receive specialized instances of that function. This makes our code more reusable, more efficient, and less prone to bugs. So how do we get started? Well, first we need to recognize our pattern and then determine its components. So in this example, I've got a formula that converts uh, Fahrenheit degrees to Celsius. Uh, so basically, I need to analyze this, and I see that I have an input. I have a numeric amount I offset by. I have a factor that I'll factor that input by. And then I take in some unit label that I'll label my new unit with. So I can make a generic function that does that, and that looks like this. It takes in those four factors, and it'll apply that calculation. And then I can create a curried version of it using Ramda.curry. Now I can call that generator function with three different sets of arguments, and I'm left with three functions that all convert different things. So miles to kilometers, pounds to kilograms, and Fahrenheit to Celsius, all coming from that one curried function I created. Uh, if I didn't do this, I would have to type out probably triple the amount of code, and I could have a bug in either one of those formulas, whereas here the bug would come from a single function. So putting it all together, uh, this is the moment that you've all been waiting for where we're going to talk about how to build those beautiful, powerful, flexible queries that I've been hyping up. So to apply this to our model queries, we first need to know what is in a model. Uh, yeah, like with the, uh, the temperature converter, a model query can be broken down into parts where basically we have a model name, we have a query type, we have this options object, and then, uh, because I'll be normalizing the data in this query, I also need to take in a normalized schema. So when I convert that into a generic function, it looks something like this. Uh, basically, I also pass in a fourth argument, which is normalized bool, which will allow you to say true or false that you want to normalize that data. So when that Boolean is true, you receive, and that's the fourth parameter, you receive back a function that waits for that schema, and then we'll return a function that we'll call the model query. Uh, if you give it false, you'll instead return back a function that, when invoked, will just give you a promise for that raw data. Uh, so a deeper implementation of this could be uh, you could code in there to reject any query type that isn't an actual SQLized uh, query. Or we could maybe split up that options object so that we could pass in a where object earlier I mean an include object earlier and pass in a where object later when we have a more specific idea of what we want to do with the function. So when we pass that function through r.curry or manually curry it ourselves, we end up something like this, which is a function that takes in an argument and then returns a function that takes in an argument and returns a function that takes in an argument until you get to what we want to do. And all of those functions will have closure over the arguments we passed in earlier. So with our model query generator built, we can now compose all the, models for, all the model queries for our application. Uh, we don't need to write out the whole pattern again. We just call the function with partially applied arguments. So I have a couple examples up here. Uh, example one is the generate normalized products query. Uh, this is basically a model specific generator, which uh, I have passed in the products model, and I've passed in that I want to normalize the data, and I've passed in the schema. So it already knows where my data is in that products object. Now I can call this many different times later on with a different query type and with a different option for that query. And I don't have to think about the schema or the model ever again. I've already set that up. Uh, my second example here is the genera generate normalized find all query. 
which basically this is a function where we create a function that will return a generic find all that returns normalized data depending on whatever model uh, and normalized schema is eventually passed in. So in example three, I'm going to use the function I created in example two to make a batch of queries for our models. And so I do that by calling dot map on an array of nested arrays that hold a model type and a schema. And for each one of those, it will pass in the final arguments to that example two function. And it will, instead, it will then return a specific query to me for that model with that schema, with that type. Uh, so then below that, I just save those out of the array that just got mapped. And then I can call model one find all, and I'll get my pretty data. Woohoo. So let's play a little game. Would you guys rather code this out for maybe 200 lines, code every query you can think of that you're going to use throughout your app, and just repeat the same stuff over and over? Or would you rather do this, where we write the query once, and then we're just calling a function to tailor it for our purposes? What would you guys rather do, A or B? B, yeah, I think I heard enough Bs. But, uh, so I think you guys get the idea. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to me. I hope that you now have a desire to try out some of these more powerful functions and save your fingers. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck, and I have more about this on my blog, and these are two other very resourceful uh, links.